Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. So I'm Tirumini. I'm going to chair the session. It's 15, 15 minutes presentation, but we've got four to five minutes. So we're going to do 15 minutes, five minutes Q&A for each, and then five minutes extra if you want to ask questions. So we've got Alice who's going to present around accessibility first, and then we have Owen, Laura, and sorry, I forgot your name. Um, Matt, Matthew. So uh, I've got one with me here. So when you have QA, I'll come by and post you this to for the questions because we've got people joining online. So the floor is yours, Alice. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, I know that there's quite a lot of really good sessions on at the moment as well. So um, I'm definitely going to be asking about how we can get those recordings afterwards so that I can catch up on, on other people's. Um, good sessions that are happening too. Uh, so yeah, my name's Alice Chapman. I am at the Arden University. Um, you may have heard of us, you may not. We've, we've had a few sessions um, taking place over the last couple of days uh, where you can find a little bit more about us and I will talk a little bit about us uh, too. Um, but I'm the product developer in the learning design team at Arden University, which I will introduce as well. Um, and I'm here today to talk about digital learning accessibility and just to sort of tell you a little bit about what we're doing uh, at the moment and uh, our next steps as well. So in this presentation, I'm going to introduce um, Arden University and Digital Learning Team. I'm going to talk about the inclusive practice enhancement projects that we currently have um, happening at our university, specifically the inclusive learning review. Um, and looking at the inclusive learning training sessions that we've received in the digital learning team as well. Uh, I'm going to talk about the process in action, a very high level um, example of that, and look at the next steps that we've got in place as well. And I'm going to try and keep in, in time. That's the other thing I'm going to try to do. Um, so what uh, I'm going to begin with is just talk a little bit about Arden University. So we are a distant, uh, distant, Digital first, I'll get my words out. We're a digital first distance and blended learning uh, provider. And we have got study centers across the UK and in Berlin. We have um, lots of different types of students that come to us. Um, and we, as, as you can see on the slide, it says Arden aims to help people thrive and succeed through real, real world relevant education that is fueled by technology shaped by employers and built around learners' lives. And I think that really sums us up quite well. Um, I think we are really keen to make sure that we've got opportunities in place for people, uh, whatever background they are from. Um, and we have got quite a flexible learning model that uh, we, we put together. And I'll talk about that in the, uh, as I come to the digital learning team. But our average student is around the age of 30 and they are often full time workers or they are uh, they have lots of other responsibilities they are carers. They've got lots of other things that are going on in their lives. And so it's uh, really important for us to make sure that we're making what we, we do flexible for them. So this is our team. You may see this uh, this image in a few other places as well, if you have a good look um, around. Um, but we are the uh, we're a multi multidisciplinary team with expertise in learning technology, multimedia design, uh, learning design, project management, and uh, we work really hard to make sure that our academics have got the support in place to help them as they're putting together their modules and designing their modules. So the flexible teaching model that I mentioned. So this gives um, our students. 10 weeks of asynchronous content alongside either two days of uh, in-person teaching sessions a week or live online sessions. Um, and they have tutorials for distance learners as well. And all of this is often recorded for our students as well. But this means that we're creating and maintaining learning materials continuously throughout the year in our team. So um, we've just, uh, uh, colleagues that are here, they've just been talking about, um, we have built, and every time we sort of say this is it's uh, pretty amazing to be honest but we've built uh, in excess of 150 modules in the last 12 months um so the work that we're doing is continuous but what that does mean for us in our team is that it gives us the chance to build in changes so if we know that something needs changing we can make a change in that next block so looking now at the inclusive practice enhancement projects at Arden. 
We have been uh, working with a company called Diversity and Ability. You might have heard of them, you might not. If you haven't, I highly recommend that you have, have a look at them. Um, but they are a multi award winning social enterprise which specializes in training and consultancy, supporting employees and employers to be the, the best that they can be. And DNA are driven by authentic lived experience. So 85% of the DNA team identifies disabled or neurodiverse. And we began working with them at Arden to look at four main inclusive practice enhancement projects. So they've worked with us on the assistive technology enhancement audit. They've worked on the library provision review, the physical access review, and more specifically for us and our team, the inclusive learning review. So I'm going to talk more about that in this session. So first of all, we received six training sessions um, as the digital learning team because we wanted to make sure that we were aware of uh, the things that are important around disability and inclusive practices before we start doing things because, you know, we, we just didn't want to be ticking boxes to say we've done this. We wanted to know how and why we were doing it. So the first three sessions that we had were on changing the way we understand disability, evolution of disability theory, language and rights, intersectionality, what it is and why it's important. So once we'd had those three sessions, we then looked more specifically at our area and we had three sessions on inclusivity through digital accessibility, inclusive design and communications and universal design for learning, understanding inclusive principles. So that was a really good grounding for us as a team to uh, have a better understanding of what it was that we were going into before we got our review. So the review itself took place while we were having our training. And I think that worked really well because it meant that once we came off the back of that training, we got the review and we understood what, what we were being asked to do really and why we needed to do it. So as you can see, the focus of the review itself, it looked at examining current teaching, learning and curriculum practices developing new engagement methods, benchmarking and reflecting on QAA, JISC, advanced HE initiatives, and really importantly, voices from the disabled community. Practical recommendations on what disabled students expect on entering higher education and embedding uh, universal design for learning. So you can probably sit and think, well, you know, that's all well and good and like getting a review, but, uh, what are you going to do with it at that point? And I think we were really keen to make sure that this review was honest and transparent and it told us everything that we needed to do. We didn't want it to sort of be a, a fluffy, fluffy piece that um, told us, you know, oh, this is great and this is great. We wanted to know what we needed to do to change it. And we were really pleased to see that there were some things that were of best practice. And I think if anyone's considering doing this, but they're scared of this, I'd say, just go for it because you need to hold up that mirror to make those changes. And if you don't, then you don't know what you need to change. So we did that. And yes, we did have some areas of best practice, but we also had things that we needed to change. Um, and but now we know, so we can. And so by using the report, we've been able to work through recommendations and implement into process. Um, and the idea is that by using the review, we can make those changes. So let's have a very high level overview of, of an example. Um, so this example, I'm gonna talk about text alternatives and the process that we're using to make those changes. So thinking about the uh, web content accessibility guidelines alongside universal design for learning principles, um, this was created to make sure that we are considering all stakeholders across um, the areas that we work within module development and design. So text alternatives, let's use this as an example. So the main WCAG point on this, if you don't know it, if you're not like me and you seem to think about these in the middle of the night, I don't know what that says about me, but um, is that on this point, so it's 1.1.1, non-text content, all non-text content that is presented to the user has a text alternative that serves the equivalent purpose. So, you know, it's keeping that in mind, Inclusive learning and universal design tells us 
uh, we need to have alternative text and text alternatives for images, a standard, but also where images are diagrams, we need to make sure that the main point is being conveyed and that it can be read by a screen reader or if there's a text alternative. And, you know, I'm sure you're all very familiar with this, but it's actually then putting those things in place. And it can sound quite simple, but it isn't always that straightforward, is it? So number one in our process is research. So it's about researching your set to practice, regulatory and legal compliance on alternative text and image description, what is happening and what are we doing as well at Arden and what do we currently say? Which links into number two, understand. So understanding our current processes. It's about holding up that mirror and saying, do you know what? We don't actually do this or we do it for this, but I didn't realize we needed to do it for that. And that's okay. Like we can't, we can't make changes until we say we need to make them. So things that you need to consider in this, especially are the type of platform that you're using, how are you adding that into, into practice and who is responsible for doing that? And if you are getting it, getting it right, how do you get it right in other areas? Number three is identify. So identifying areas for improvement in the processes and highlighting areas of good practice to continue doing. So it could be noting that there's not currently a space to put something in and um, putting that space in. So is it missing alternative text in a template? Just ask the academics to, to give that to you if you're not sure. Um, also, this could be a chance to speak to the inclusion uh, to a student panel. So we've got a student inclusion panel that's been newly created. And uh, in my final slide in a moment, I'll talk a little bit more about them. But just to get their lived experience and to find out if what you're doing is actually working for them. So number four is provide. Providing training and resources for all stakeholders. So this includes creation of resources, understanding, good practice for alternative text and image description. And it's not only the logistics of how to add it, but how do you actually write it? And I think that's often the biggest, I mean, this is just one example of an area, but this is quite a big, uh, this is something that people come to us quite a lot for. So to house all these resources, we created a SharePoint site on digital accessibility, and that is available for all of our um, colleagues at Arden, um, and they can look at things like this to help them in creating their resources. So the fifth point is implement and implementing a clear process on alternative text and image description and how it can be embedded into the development process. So this might be in onboarding of our subject matter experts and new people and training and documentation as well. And finally, present. And so that's presenting findings to the wider community and that might be um, it might be that that goes out on our SharePoint site. It might be that that's through our governance structure where we've got student representation, trying to get that feedback as well um, so that we can make those changes in the next block. And I will share these slides with you as well, um, which I realise I should have done beforehand if I was being truly accessible, um, but they will come to you. So the next step, steps for us, um, we are now in the process of implementing all of our baseline requirements for the digital learning content. And we aim to have this in place for the modules that we create. Uh, we use Articulate Rise. Um, in those spaces, we're, we're hoping to have all of that in place uh, by the uh, start of the new year. And we're well on our way. We've got a multimedia design and learning design handbooks that are being made by the teams that are going to be used. They're made by the teams and they're for the teams. Um, and so these give the opportunity for us to create uh, blocks that we can use as well to help with certain areas of making sure that there is text alternatives in place. Um, sorry about the microphone feedback there. Um, and just making sure that there is uh, a sort of placeholder so that we can check that that's definitely happening as we go through. The digital accessibility pages on the SharePoint are being continuously updated and we're asking to make sure that we've got those in place for people if they need them. And finally, the student inclusion panel. So this is a paid role for current students um, and they are able to join the panel and we invite people from uh, lots of different backgrounds um, to come and hear initiatives from the Faculty of Learning and Teaching. And this gives them a chance to have discussions around what they think needs to be done with, this, with certain things. Um, but they're also given the opportunity to feedback afterwards if they don't want to have that conversation in a group. 
And then those things go th through into the governance structure if they're uh, successful, but it just means that we're building in that student consultation as we go. So I realised that was quite a lot of information in 15 minutes and I uh, hugely regret not having gone for a 30 minute slot at least <laughs> um, to talk more about it, but maybe next year, either myself or somebody else from our team will be up here presenting and telling you uh, of all the successes, hopefully, um, that we've we've continued to, to work on. But I hope this has been helpful and you please do uh, contact me afterwards or catch me outside if you're here in person or on uh, Discord if you're online. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, that's us. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. We've actually got five minutes uh, for Q and A. If you have, if you have questions, anyone got question? I'll pass the mic around. Yeah. Oh, it's a question. <laughs> Thought I was getting out of it then. No one put their hand up. Thank you. So, Alice, out of that report and those recommendations that we got which one is the most challenging to actually implement or to act on from your perspective? That's a good question. Um, I think that, I, I don't think that they are, I, th I don't think that there is one in particular that I would say is especially challenging. I think the challenge is around time. It's around um, understanding, it's, you, you may like we may understand what why we need to do it but sometimes it's about getting stakeholders on side and so it might be that uh, you might be held up by another team there's some difficulties they've got another project going on and we can't take something forward but what I think we have been able to do is in our model we're able to put in interim solutions to make sure that we are addressing those things at least uh, for the time being knowing that that is not a plaster we're not just going to leave that forever it's intended to be there as something to get us through the next block while we come back to it to look at the next the, the following block and yeah we are in um, a, a privileged position in the sense of we have got uh, uh, we've got a different cycle, which means that we are able to implement those changes probably a little bit more quickly because we can put them into the next block, um, the next block of, of teaching. But it's about making sure that those people who aren't going to get to that block have got the support in place as well. So I would say that. Does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Now, uh, we don't have any other questions, right? Okay, we've got one more. Thank you. Hi. Um, I have a question about your next step. So you mentioned that uh, one, your first one is around uh, implementing baseline standards. And I just wondered, could you tell us a little bit more about what that's going to look like? And how will that differ from the existing like legislative baseline requirements? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a really great point, actually. I think that's about the language as well that I've used in the slide. So um, it's in line with legislative baseline requirements. Um, it's in line with, more explicitly, it's in line with the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines Level AA. What we are doing at the moment is we're creating um, content blocks within Articulate Rise to support. Um, so the best way to do this is as an example, basically. So if I think about there's a video, someone's put a video into their uh, content. And there are captions on the video, but we have to, the, the student has got the option to turn those on. So we can create a block within RISE, a text block. It might be in an accordion. It might just be a text block that says, um, there are captions available for this, uh, this video. What you need to do is, if you go down to the right-hand side, you click on this. So what we're doing is we're creating um, these blocks that can be put into our content so that the people that are building those modules can say, right, I've got a video. I know that I need to include this block to make this accessible for people. And it's, sometimes it's about um, having a reminder to say, this needs captions. Um, and so having that there is a reminder for us to say, actually, that video's not got captions. That's got to go back. We need to get that sorted. 
um, but it's also a chance for the students to learn how to, to, to sort of use that. That, again, is a very basic example, um, but those that's the sort of way that we are um, putting together those uh, those baseline criteria into the modules. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Thank, <laughs> Thank you so you. much, Alice. Uh, now we'll like to... Uh...